And good evening and welcome to Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. Welcome to another round of mystery, madness, mayhem, and uh, some unexpected things as well. It's good to have you all aboard. It's good to see and be seen. Um, yeah, I was talking to a new listener recently, and the listener was sort of telling me they like my show, they like like what we do, but they said, you're all over the place. And I went, yeah, that's kind of the point. This was never supposed to be a show about one thing. We started out back in 2009 kind of doing UFO and paranormal type material, but we've always mixed in um, a lot of different subjects, uh, philosophy, spirituality, uh, religion, I guess, occultism, mysticism, uh, politics, deep politics, all of it, you know? And the whole point of a show like this is to follow the muse, to go where the host goes, and hopefully where I go, your interests lie as well. And that's my big interest. So uh, you can contact us through the website, offplanetradio.com. And for um, information on the TV show, you can go to offplanetmedia.com offplanetmedia.net yeah offplanetmedia.net I forget my domains and to the end of variety and of uh, a one more announcement I'm happy to say that I've been recently contacted again by Chris Holly and Chris Holly and I are going to be working together doing some uh, podcast shows as well for those of you who are fans of the paranormal the UFO scene and of course Chris Holly she'll be back um, next week and you want to check out offplanetradio.com for that information as well. So as saying to the end of doing shows that are diverse, um, my guest tonight intersects a lot of interests that I have. Specifically, we're going to talk about Freemasonry and specifically to that, the subject of his first book, which um, is called The Royal Arch of Enoch. We're also going to go into tonight film symbolism as well. We're going to um, cut a pretty wide path. I don't know where we're going. I don't I don't really pilot this thing. I just kind of drive the bus. And to that end, I want to welcome my guest tonight, Robert W. Sullivan, author, l- law uh, jurist, philosopher. He's going to tell us all about what he is. Robert, good evening and welcome to the show. Hey, Randy. Thanks for having me on uh, Off Planet Radio. It's uh, great to be with you tonight. It's good to have you on, and uh, like I said, uh, you intersect a lot of interesting aspects of things that I've followed for a long time, uh, pers- specifically the issue of Freemasonry, which we want to dig into a lot, and I, this book that you've written, your first book, as I understand, The Royal Arch of Enoch, I would call this a, I would call this a resource for anybody who wants to know the deep things about Freemasonry, specifically um, Royal Arch Masonry, and uh, what goes into the different orders of the lodges. And um, I know that you have a background that includes a tenure at Oxford in England, and you also are are a, you, uh, you describe yourself as a jurist, so I assume that means you have a law degree, and you can explain all of that by, let's start with this, Robert. Um, Give us a little bit of your background from your perspective, and then we'll go into the history of your involvement with Freemasonry. Sure, Randy. Um, Again, thank you for having me on your program tonight. Um, This journey for me really started, um, and what you just mentioned is correct, um, really for me when I was back at a a junior, um, I spent my junior year abroad. Um, I, I'm, I was a, I graduated from Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, but I spent my junior year abroad at St. Catherine's College um, at Oxford University, and it was there that I really got introduced um, to the idea of the hermetic tradition, um, the occult, mysticism, secret societies, um, and their influence on material culture, you know, socially, economically, politically, religiously, spiritually. Um, and it was just a subject that fascinated me. Even going back as a child, I always used to, um, you know, I was born in the early 1970s, so I grew up on the In Search of show with Leonard Nimoy. So, you know, the supernatural, UFOs, cryptozoology, um, this always interested me, and, and this seemed like a natural um, subject matter for me. And, and 
it, it really, you know, it was just something that really piqued my interest um, while I was over there in symbolism and, you know, secret societies and mysticism and comparative religion and, you know, things like that. Um, and I really began, you know, I guess you could say the kernel um, was planted over there. And over the next 20 years, I just did research and writing um, and, and, and just exploring this material and reading books about it. And in, in 19, you know, I know you want to ask me, in 1997, I, I became a Freemason of a Blue Lodge here in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, in 1999, I became a Scottish Rite Mason of the 32nd degree. Um, in 1997, I went to law school and graduated that in 2000. Um, I, I would say that I, I really began to put um, pen to paper with this book probably around the mid-2000s, around 2004, 2005. Um, and and by, by 2012, um, it was pretty much complete, and the book was published, the Royal Archive Enoch was published in 2012. I mean, I, I, I really, it, it doesn't have everything in it, of course. I mean, there are different aspects of Freemasonry. I mean, it's a vast subject matter. I mean, there's Freemasonry in the Civil War. But I was really trying to put together um, this massive compendium that just went through a lot of the Blue Lodge symbolism, how this carried over into the high degrees, and how this one particular high degree, um, in specific, because of what's going on in this degree as compared to what's going on in the Blue Lodge um, was so important within Masonry and how much and how so much of the symbolism and, and the philosophy and underlying history of this ritual was being used in material culture and um, and, and most importantly and I guess the main thesis of the Royal Arch of Enoch book was um, to present this historical anomaly that I had discovered which was that, the, that this ritual, this particular high degree ritual, um, which was being cultivated and developed in France in the 1740s, 1750s, um, was incorporating elements and what I guess would be best described as philosophical components of the lost book of Enoch, um, which is essentially off the history pages of Western civilization from around the second, third century um, common era to 1773. Yet in 1740s, 1750s, clearly there must have been a copy out there floating around Europe. So I wanted to present that and you know talk about um, how this ritual was reflecting um, some of the components and elements of this book. That's I guess is really the main thesis. And then I go into this uh, symbolic historical take on Freemasonry and how this ritual and the Masonic symbols um, are just being used in society left and right, and especially in the United States of America. Um, and uh, that then that led me to my second book, which was Cinema Symbolism, which maybe talk about in a little while, um, which was kind of the way I ended the Royal Arch was talking about, um, I wanted to bring the Royal Arch of Enoch up to modern day. So the final chapter of Royal Arch of Enoch delved into um, some of this very adroitly concealed Masonic symbolism and solar symbolism going on in movies such as um, the National Treasure movies, um, which has a lot going on beneath the yeah, surface. Da definitely. Vinci Code, yeah, being there, being there, Excalibur, um, things like that. So that's my background, and um, that's sort of just you know the main premise of uh, Royal Arch of Enoch. Now, um, just uh, by way of disclosure of my background as well, my interest in masonry goes back to being a kid. I grew up in this weird hybrid type family. Half of my family were fundamentalist evangelical Christians, and the other half, my father's side, were all Freemasons. And um, my grandfather was a 32nd degree um, Royal Arch Mason. He was a Shriner. Um, my dad was a third degree Blue Mason, and he, I, I don't know how far up my dad matric matriculated into the lodge later on. I, I think he was largely the, uh, a Blue Lodge um, initiate. So uh, I was curious about it. I never, I never joined. And the reason why I didn't join was because I actually learned a lot about it sitting outside of it, including the things that were shared with me specifically by my grandfather over the years. So it's kind of a weird anomaly. Um, usually, people who join Freemasonry receive an invitation. Was that your situation as well? Right, right. And it, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, it's, it's two ways to do it. Um, to, to join a Masonic Lodge, um, a lot of times, there, there's two ways you can do it. Um, you, you're not, as a, as, a, as a Freemason, you're not supposed to solicit membership. Um, right. You know, now that now that does happen, of course. I mean, you know, people have friends. Hey, why don't you join? Or, or family members. Hey, you should join. It it does happen, of course. You're not really so technically supposed to solicit membership, but people do, and it 
it, it's not frowned upon or anything because everybody does it. Um, te- technically, the way to join is, and this is the way I join. Um, I mean, you're right. Also, for, for my family, I have a. I come from a long line of Masons. Um, a lot of my grandfathers and great grandfathers were. Um, interestingly, it skipped over my father, but um, it was around the mid '90s um, that that I had I had gotten out of college. I graduated Gettysburg, but this was before I went to law school, um, and it was through a, a mutual friend of my my mother and father. Um, who was a Mason. Um, he was a Freemason of a, a Blue Lodge here in Maryland, um, in Baltimore. Um, and I, I, he wore the Masonic ring, um, you know, the square encompasses with the letter G. And I saw that, and I, I you know, the whole line is, um, and you'll see this in Masonic literature and even on bumper stickers, um, to be one, ask one. Um, and, you know, if, if you see a Mason you want to join, um, you ask them. And I, that's exactly what I did. I went up to him and I said, hey, I see you're a Freemason. I said, uh, you know, I'm out of college now. Um, so, you know, I have time for this. And I, at this point, like I said, I hadn't gone to law school yet. I said, I want to join. And he, he said, okay. Um, and, and, and through him, um, I got the petition in the mail. Um, I filled it out. I mailed my check-in um, to, to the lodge. And uh, sure enough, this, this would have been around the summer of 1996. Um, not sure if your listeners are aware, but the, uh, Freemasons do not meet in the summer. Um, the lodge goes what's called dark. Um, Blue Lodge Masonry does not meet over the summer. It actually goes back, um, it's a tradition that goes back to the founding of Mason, Masonry in the 1700s. Um, it's because of the summers were too hot and there were no air conditioning in the lodges. So the Masonic Lodge is basically closed down in July and August. At any rate, um, I sent my petition in. A committee was sent up. They interviewed me. Uh, I went through a voting process and got accepted and um, was initiated into the first degree in uh, January of 1997. Um, and that's how I joined. And um, you know, you know, the, what I would say to you and your listeners is, if it, you know, you, you know, it, it, I've seen this backfire before, where um, a person—it's usually a family member, it's like a son or a cousin—you um, know—and generally that person has really, generally, no interest in masonry, but they get talked into it, um, and you know, by by the family member who is a mason, I mean, that that usually doesn't end well. Um, the guy, the person, nine times out of ten will come up, maybe do one or two of the rituals. Um, and then disappear, just has no interest in it anymore. So that's why they, they, you know, they tell you not to solicit membership. Um, if you're really interested in joining, you should just find a Mason or contact the Masonic Blue Lodge or even a state Grand Lodge, um, and they can, ha- they can assist you in, in, in becoming a member. That, that's at least the way I did it. There is perceptions about Freemasonry that are all over the map. And <clears throat> might as well address this in the front end of the interview. Um, my view of masonry as a kid was relatively benign um, because I saw my parents. My mom went to Eastern Star. My dad went to lodge meetings. My grandfather took me to events at the shrine, uh, the Masonic shrine here. We, we lived in the capital city of the state of Pennsylvania, which, as you know, is a pretty, well, key state in terms of Freemasonry. And so there was a lot of activity. But the perception today is because of the power that lodge members seem to have acquired in business, politics, um, religion, and things like that, there is a whole stratum of thinking that they're everything from a neighborhood social club to, frankly, the perception that they are blood-drinking Satanists. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's kind of maybe navigate that a little bit. Give me your perception of the reality of Freemasonry membership in the lodge and what it means and specifically what it means to you right it's, it's a lot to answer there i'll do my best <laughs> to, to navigate this no no it's a good question um i will start off by saying um there is a reason when you're you're absolutely right pennsylvania is of course the keystone state um this ties into royal arch freemasonry there's a reason why it's very occult ridden um why pennsylvania is known as the keystone um, and the answer ties into Royal Arch Freemasonry. I delve into that in the book. But at any rate, yeah, I mean, um, you, you, you are right. I mean, you know, you, you read some of this stuff on, online about this. I mean, I get it all the time, too. I mean, you know, uh, you know, people, you know, high ranking Freemasons are reptile people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there, there is this, you know, um, a cabal in Freemasonry that worships the devil and wants to take over the world. Um, by and large, um, Freemasonry, the, the, the really the, 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 there's different phases of Freemasonry through history, and, and what you're really dealing with um, is, is 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 it's really it's really hard to explain. By and large, Freemasonry is just this very large fraternal system 
Um, you have the Blue Lodge, and then you have the High Degree System. Um, I have been involved with it um, for almost 20 years now, and I have never one time um, seen anything that I would describe as satanic or evil or anything like this, even even remotely close to it. That being said, it's very it is a very old organization. It does have power. It does have influence um, in the community. Um, you look at it in the development of the founding of the United States, where a lot of the founders were Freemasons. A lot of the the men who were crafting the United States after the death of Washington were using Freemasonry, using the symbols to really forge the nation. Um, and I think, and you know, you know, you'll find this in, you know, even in the architecture of things like Washington D.C., Baltimore, Maryland. You'll find it with Erie Canal. I mean, you'll find it all over the damn place when, when, when you really go looking for it. Um, and I think, you know, you know, what these guys are doing is they're all Masons and they're using Masonry and the and the morality lessons and the symbols and the teachings of Masonry um, to do this because they see it as very positive. Um, you know, they say, like like myself. I mean, this is all very positive. Um, unfortunately. Um, there's really no transparency with it, and people see it, and it's not explained to them, and then they figure it out, oh, this is Masonic, and they see it as this evidence of this demonic, overarching, evil, pre-Masonic conspiracy, which doesn't exist, but you have guys who are using masonry um, in common day life and, and for city planning for positive, um, but again, because there's no um, you know, transparency with it, People will see it 200 years later. I mean, Washington, D.C. is a, a great example. And, you know, people just see it as this overarching, um, you know, evil, evil evidence of this evil conspiracy, which doesn't exist. If it does exist, I've never seen it. Um, and then, of course, you get into things with the Illuminati. Um, and, of course, they, that was a real group. Um, and they're very influential. Um, by all accounts, they seem to have gone out of business by and I'm being generous here, by no later than the 1820s. Yeah. Um, but clearly there is an, there is an Illuminati influence in, in the United States, um, you know, in, in its earlier days. And, uh, again, people seem to seem to want to peg this group as um, hanging around, um, you know, when they, they, they appear to have been long out of business. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, you know with Freemasonry, you, you definitely have um, it being very important at the development of the United States is sort of at the mystical core of the new country and especially in the high degree systems. So, I mean, yeah, you will find this very heavy Masonic influence going on, which I would describe as, like you said, benign or positive, um, but people want to see it as evil. Um, and it's been going on since day one, and I'm sure it will be going on um, 200 years from now. Freemasonry for me was really um, sort of this, this I, I really felt like I was carrying on a family tradition, and it really, for, for me, when you when I went through the rituals, um, and especially in the Blue Lodge, you'll go through it, you kind of, you know, if, if you don't have any, like, if you've never read, like, Manly P. Hall or Albert Mackey, you're Correct. just going to go through it and just think, it's, you know, it's just this innocuous ritual um, or meaningless ritual that's based on the Bible, and that's it. But if you really start reading the, you know, you know, these guys who get into some of the very deep occult symbolisms going on in the ritual, I mean, you're going to find very comparative religion, Christian, Gnostic elements going on, um, you know, in Kabbalah, things like that, go, both going on in the Blue Lodge and the High Degrees, um, which a lot of the Masons aren't aware of because they don't really take the time um, to sit down and, and re read the, these works. I did. Um, and this, again, you know, influenced me with writing my books. And just, just to wrap the question up, I mean, I, I can tell you this, um, Randy, I mean, neither book, um, Royal Arch of Enoch or Cinema Symbolism, would exist, would exist if I hadn't become a Freemason. I know that for certain. This interest in this um, <clears throat> character, Enoch, <clears throat> it's kind of a fascinating thing. I mean, like I said, I, I grew up around churches. I grew up around religion. I have a background in theology and mm -hmm. this concept of Enoch you know he's not a huge figure in the Bible he's mysterious I mean what's it say uh, Enoch walk, walked with God and was no more um, that pretty much summarizes what we know but then we have this book that's external to the so called accepted scriptures uh, the book of Enoch specifically Enoch, Enoch first Enoch which then gives us a lot of detail into Enoch seemingly navigating these other worlds. And I suspect that the drama in all of that is what plays into the Royal Arch of Enoch and into what appears to be baked in somehow to Masonic lore. 
Yeah, I, I think that's um, some. You know, I think you're 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 on the right path there, um, Randy. Um, it, it's really it's really. Uh, I'm going to try to condense the answer, but it's a lot. To, it's a lot to digest. Um, you have. I mean, you're absolutely right. You have Enoch um, being mentioned in the Book of Genesis briefly. Um, Enoch is one of two people in the Bible never to experience a physical death. Um, Enoch is the first, is one prophet. Elijah is the other. Right. And you're absolutely cor- you're absolutely correct. Um, the Book of Enoch, Ethiopian Enoch, one e- Enoch, um, which dates to around the Second Temple period, um, it details Enoch's um, interaction in, in the afterlife, um, or you know, in heaven or in this other world. Um, and you know, it's definitely a controversial book. I mean, you're absolutely right; it's left out of the out of the Bible. Um, and Enoch interacts with this group of fallen angels, um, demons known as the Watchers, um, who have displeased. Um, God by coming down to earth and mating with human women, creating this race of giants known as the Nephilim. Um, and he sort of acts as a lawyer, for lack of a better word, um, as an intermediary, be, you know, for them uh, with God. And he serves, you know, serves as a lawyer. The name Enoch, interesting, you know, this ties into masonry, actually means the initiate. Um, so, so you, and then you have Enoch gleaning this, this sort of um, wisdom. I mean, this is where it really gets into masonry. Um, this wisdom from the demons, such as reading and writing, which ultimately becomes the seven liberal arts and sciences. Um, and, and what you have going on um, in the Blue Lodge, and again, I'm plowing over a ton of material here right now. Um, in the Blue Lodge, in this third degree, um, this is the, the map. Uh oh. Did we drop? <clears throat> does appear as though we lost Rob, but I don't understand why. It looks like uh, the connection's still alive. Are we still? Gosh, you know, this is like the worst thing in the world on a live show, but it's it's part of. Do we still have Rob on the line? The... Yeah, the connection is live. Okay, Rob, uh, we lost you, man. And I'm left to sit here kind of looking at the camera. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to wait until Rob uh, calls back in. Um, I have no way to contact him. Let's just... Uh... This is it, folks. This is live radio. Uh, this is what you get. Um, internet technology at its finest. So what we're going to do here is drop Rob off. Hello. 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 Yeah, you're there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. All right, we lost you. Yeah, the call dropped. Okay, good. You're back. Yep. Oh, what, what I was saying, am I coming in Okay. Yeah, you're fine. You're doing great, Rob. Okay, no, what what I what just to pick up on what I left off with, um, was in the Blue Lodge you have Hiram Abiff, he's murdered. He's the architect of Solomon's Temple. Um, he is murdered um by three fellow crafts who want um the secret word that Hiram Abiff has. Um it's it's the name of God, it's the word that all wisdom derives from. He's murdered, the word is lost. Um, mm-hmm. It's the name of God. It's what's generally referred to as the Tetragrammaton. Um, and the word is lost. Um, and when the candidate is brought back to life, um, the, the, the true word, this true name of God is lost. And he's raised, the, the candidate is brought back to life with a substitute word, um, a substitute name of God. At any rate, you fast forward to the high degree, um, the, the, the word, um, the secret name is recovered in this royal arch of Enoch um, ceremonial. It's discovered in this subterranean vault during the construction of the second temple of Zorobabel, which is the temple after Solomon's temple. Um, mm-hmm. At any rate, um, what you're dealing with, and, and, and you're dealing with the concept of the restoration of, of the secret name. I mean, this comes straight out of the book of Enoch, where Enoch goes into heaven and beholds the tree of life, Kabbalah, which is the emanation of the name of God, and is the, you know, of all, which all wisdom derives from. And what it does, what, what you have going on in the high degree, it's really a form of what you would call you know, I mean, you know, it's really Kabbalistic apotheosis, where in the Blue Lodge, in the third degree, the candidate is raised, 
um, and has what you would basically call a Gnostic ascension, where he is brought to wisdom or light when he's brought back to life as Hiram Abiff. But in the, in the high degrees, you have this apotheosis uh, by beholding this secret word in this royal arch ceremonial. Um, the candidate becomes godlike, and the idea is that this is, you know, and this was the way it was done back in the Doed days of the founding of the country when this ceremony was worked was um, that by, be, by, by becoming a member of the royal arch, um, and, and by beholding the secret word, and this is where masonry gets a lot of its bad rap from, um, this was now a warrant for not only you to go out and affect positive change in the community, but to actually become a leader in the community. Um, and, a, you know, a lot of masons who achieve power, um, you know, had to be exalted to the Holy Royal Arch of Enoch degree mm -hmm. in order to do it. Um, this came out of the works of a man named Thomas Smith Webb. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's really um, Enoch plays, and the Book of Enoch is, is really um, important in the high degree system. Like I said, it's, it's probably um, the most important degree um, in the high degrees um, is this Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial. It's the seventh in the York Rite. It's the, um, it's the 13th in the Scottish Rite. And um, like I said, it was developed in 1740, 1750s in France, um, incorporating elements of the Book of Enoch prior to it being um, returned to the West. When we think of the character Hiram of Beef, um, he tends to be um, related more to what we see in the Bible as Hiram and connected to Solomon and the building of the temple. How, how close do they parallel? Is it the same person? Or what does, where does Solomon fit into the overall theme of all this? Right, right. In the in the Blue Lodge ritual, um, the Masons are building Solomon's Temple, and Hiram Abiff um, is the master architect. Um, the the whole third degree ritual, the candidate actually portrays Hiram Abiff, um, and and the entire third degree ritual um, is a retelling. It's a, it's a it's a solar ritual. Um, it's a retelling of the Osirian cycle in Egypt, uh -huh. where Hiram Abiff is this um, resurrected Sun Man. Um, who, who's killed and resurrected, um, you know, numerous um, Egyptian motifs, um, you know, tying into this. And, uh, you know, uh, like, for example, I mean, Hiram um, he he's killed by three fellow crafts. His body is buried west of the temple, representing the setting sun. When he's finally brought back to life, um, he's uh, brought back to life on something called strong grip of a lion's paw. Um, that's a reference to the constellation of Leo the lion, which is the sole house of the sun. Was missing. Um, Solomon dispatches 12 fellow craft to go look for the body. These are the 12 houses of the zodiac um, looking for their lead lost solar ruler. Um, you have Hiram Abiff's uh, body being buried under something called a sprig of acacia. That's a flower sacred to the sun god Apollo. And, of course, Hiram Abiff is resurrected um, on the third try. And when, when he's resurrected, when the candidate's brought back to life, um, this is in the third degree, um, this word, this substitute word is whispered in his ear. This is the substitute name of God. He's brought back to life um, on something known as the um, five points of fellowship. Um, and, of course, the five points form a pentagram, and this is a reference to, um, in Freemasonry, the pentagram is the um, symbol um, of the Egyptian dog star Sirius, um, who is the virgin mother Isis. And, and the parallel you're looking for is um, she also possessed the secret word of the sun god named amun Ray or ra um, which she used to um, resurrect Osiris to birth Horus, who was um, Osiris's solar stand-in. So when the candidate is brought back to life, he's pays homage to his sister mother who births this by being brought back to life on five points um, and having this substitute name, um, the substitute name of God whispered in his ear. The true name is recovered in the Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial, which again is the uh, 13th in the Scottish Rite and the um, 7th in the uh, York Rite. So what is the restoration of, of the solar icon in Freemasonry? What when 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 we when you write about the restoration of the solar icon, is that the restoration of the solar icon to humanity or to Freemasonry? Well, it's the restoration of the Tetrapitan. It's the name of God. The okay. um, the, 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 the 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 character, the candidate, as it was dead, um, and it is now brought back to life. Um, and the idea is, you're being brought from darkness to life. You're be, you know by being brought back from a symbolic 
symbolic life, um, you can now, you know, you, you have received ascension, uh, it's, and you can go out and, you know, positive change in the world. The, the, that's, that's the thing behind it. The, um, the candidate, um, when, when he is back, um, ha, you know, you know, he has the substitute word, but the true name of God is, is, um, Resurrected or is, is restored um, in the Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial. Um, this is again part of the high degrees where the name of God is restored um, by the candidate during this building of the second temple. Um, and it's it's really you know you know it's like the Grail quest. That's the end of the story. That's where the Masonic story ends. Um, and within Masonry, with this Royal Arch ceremonial, um, it's really the it, it's the, by being the be all be all of the story. It's that ritual that you're going to find a ton of the symbolism. Um, coming out of, um, you know, when you're dealing with, like, the cultivation of the United States, um, you know, a lot of the symbolism going on in the federal district. You're fine, Blue Lodge, um, as well, but when you fuse that with the Royal Arch Ceremony, you know, ritual, um, you know, a lot of questions will be answered. You, you mentioned the architecture and specifically um, the architecture of landmarks in the United States, and we can go to Washington, D.C., um, a city that was laid out on a grid by a by a mason, Pierre L'Enfant, right? Correct, and um, basically is designed to be the central city of the Western culture, as I understand it. So I lose Robert again. Hello. We're having terrible landline problems tonight. And so for those of you who are watching, listening, bear with us here. Robert has to come in on a phone line, and uh, yeah, we patched him in. So let's see here. It looks like he's... You know, there's, there's no net when this happens. I'm basically left to my own devices because... Um, unlike pre-produced shows or uh, network, I can't go go to commercial. So there's like no commercial. And so hopefully Rob will come back. And I'm noticing a lot of clicking on his line, which tells me that you know, people get messed with all the time doing these shows. I'm back, I'm back by the way. You're back, you're back, good, good. That's okay, I was just chattering. Trying to trying to keep everybody's on their toes here. Okay, so yeah, we got the we got the we got the men in black tonight. I think uh, messing yeah, around. Yeah, no, I'm this. hearing all these strange clicks on the line, and uh, that's not a good. That's never a good thing. So hello, I, I got beeping. I've got beeping going on here. Okay, well, good evening, NSA, CIA, whatever alphabet agencies listening. Um, we're just sharing. Anyway, I, did you catch my last question, which basically went to the heart of what the meaning of Washington D.C. is? Well, what the well, I mean that that's you know it's it's the it's the federal capital um, of the you know it's what what I really what I really describe in the Royal Arch of Enoch book is I mean I say the United States is essentially a Masonic republic, mm. um, you know it's really the f world's first Masonic republic, so. Um, you know, when you have um, the federal capital, um, you know, I talk about this more in the book, you know, what's the most important symbol within Freemasonry? I mean, sun, um, you know, you're going to find solar iconography um, all over the place um, in, in the federal district. I mean, the sun is an important symbol. It's probably the premier symbol in the Blue Lodge, and you'll find a lot of solar iconography in the high degrees. So with the federal district, with Washington, D.C., um, you're going to, I mean, I really, I mean, the chapter on Washington, D.C. in the Royal Arch book is called, um, you know, the city of the sun, um, which is really what it is. Um, you know, and, and you'll find a lot of um, neoplatonic astrological um, solar iconography within the federal city. Um, I would say probably the most salient, you know, utopic reference for the Washington, D.C. is this novella um, by a, a Dominican friar named uh, Tomoso Campanella called The City of the Sun, um, where, you know, you're going to find the whole thing with the domed building. Um, and again, just with Washington, D.C., you're just going to find um, one Masonic um, you know, piece of architecture and symbolism after another, after another, after another. Um, it, it's really all but endless. So I guess the, the, the question I have is the perception 
that this is somehow solar worship that the and and again this goes into fundamentalism with christianity a lot uh, in spite of the fact that uh, in one old testament book of the bible it talks about the sun sul uh rising as being the son of god how closely does freemasonry mirror christianity in terms of both the symbolism and then the moral components oh i think i think it does mirror it um i mean i wouldn't call i would i mean freemasonry has been accused you know and been attacked as you know sun worship i don't think it is um what it does what it is doing is using um the sun as an emblem of light and life uh, essentially which is what the sun is um but yeah i mean you know you get into the whole third degree ritual i mean you know you will definitely see parallels i mean with christianity where you have a dying and resurrected man you have the 12 fellow crafts 12 apostles um you know you, you know so you will have this parallel with christianity um but then you have to look at christianity and ask yourself is you know christianity paralleling anything and of course the answer is yes it is um you know you have you know with you know jesus being the savior um you know uh, the, the 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 resurrected savior um you know who has 12 apostles who yeah. are the 12 houses of the zodiac um you know and you have the whole concept of the uh platonic year with uh, christianity being the sun in the house of pisces you know this is where jesus is surrounded with the fish and water symbolism so i mean you know you know you know a lot of a lot of masonic commentators have come along and said um you know oh well the third degree ritual yeah i mean this looks christian like um and i wouldn't disagree with that but then when you you got to get into it and say you got to go further than that and say you know well what's the what's christianity mirroring and, you know, and it's it's the you know it's the sun worship or solar adoration, I suppose. You know, is a better term. And you get into it. I mean, it's again, it's a retelling of um, the Osiris cycle, um, the Osiris mythology from uh, um, Egypt. You know, the, the 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 dead and resurrected sun man. I mean, you got the Virgin Mother Isis. Of course, Christ the Son is born born of the uh, Virgin Mother as well. And you know, I, I have a whole chapter on this in the book. Um, you know, this whole comparative religion um, study with. You know the Christianity, you know, with Christianity mirroring um, and echoing all these astrological um, symbolisms, which are so exhaustive and so extensive. Um, Randy, you know, you you are well beyond coincidence with this. Looking at the, um, and I want to want to focus a little bit on the United States. My understanding is that <clears throat> the destiny of the United States was prophesied by Francis Bacon in the new the New Atlantis. Um, Bacon was obviously, uh, he was Rosicrucian, and as I understand, he would have been contemporaneous with King James I of England, who was the authorizer of the King James Bible. How does, how does the history intersect between um, that particular period of time with uh, Francis Bacon, uh, King James I, and the emergence of what was basically uh, a for a version of the Bible that was was to be for the masses. Well, right. I mean, the whole thing with you know you have Francis Bacon, um, who definitely flirts with Rosicrucianism. Um, you have some people who will say that Bacon actually drafted the um, King James Bible, um, you know, or at least translated it, and you know was the author of the King James Bible. Um, then you also have Shakespeare is alleged. Um, to be the mastermind behind William Shakespeare. Um, that wouldn't surprise me in the least. Um, there's loads of evidence that points towards that. Um, and Bacon, um, it, it's interesting because Bacon is um, often thought of as sort of the carrier on of um, Dr. John D. Um, exactly. who, who, yeah, Thank and Dee just inter- walked right into my next question, so go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, well, Dee's an interesting character because, um, yeah, no, Dee, D, D, I've been asked this before. Um, you know, and, and it, it's a right, right question to ask is, you know, it's always been alleged that Bacon was the inheritor of Dr. John D. Um, and, and, you know, I've been asked, you know, we, we get into this whole concept of the lost book of Enoch or a lost book of Enoch floating around Europe um, prior to James Bruce bringing back copies in 1773. Um, where could a book of Enoch come from? Um, and you, you, you turn immediately to Dr. John D. I mean, exactly. he is very likely. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, you are, you are absolutely right, Randy. I mean, you have Dee and Kelly developing Enochian magic, which is this language to talk to angels. I mean, my God, where did you know where could he possibly be getting that from? 
um, uh, you know, that would be, of course, from the Book of Enoch. Um, and then what's really interesting with this is um, what's really fascinating is, and this question has gone unanswered, is um, you had D, um, you know, being involved with people like um, Giordano Bruno and, you know, Edmund yeah. Spencer and, uh, you know, being involved with the spy ring, you know, with Drake and Raleigh, with uh, Sir Francis Walsingham, basically to keep, keep Queen Elizabeth the first safe. Right. Um, you know, and then you have um, in, in, in his history of the world, you have Sir Walter Raleigh, who actually mentions that the Book of Enoch contains an astronomical book. Um, and, and the question is, you know, how the hell did Sir Walter Raleigh know that? Um, and the answer is he most likely got the information from Dr. John Dee. I mean, you know, the Book of Enoch would have been long unknown uh, in Sir Walter Raleigh's time. And of course, Raleigh is another interesting figure in this is, you know, there's some speculate he was put to death um, for knowing too much. But you actually had um, Raleigh mentioning in, in his History of the World um, that the Book of Enoch had an astronomy book. You know, how on earth did he know that? Um, you know, well, he had to know it from Dr. John Dee. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there's a whole interesting, I mean, and, you know, what we're talking about now, I mean, this is really one of the talking points that got me interested in this whole subject matter is, you know, the, I mean, J John Dee um, has been basically completely written off the history books. Um, I mean, he is an incredibly important character it's when you get into Elizabeth. Important. Yeah, he is. Um, yeah, in, in Elizabeth, Elizabethan England. Yeah, I got very interested in John D. in studying Enochian magic, and just out of um, curiosity and the tangential way that my mind works, I wound up reading a few um, uh, books about D. and Kelly and what they were doing in terms of basically. These were they were channeling. I mean, they were using the Enochian language, as it was called, and they were tapping into uh, something that seems very similar to me to what Enoch himself tapped into. Oh, I've, absolutely, absolutely. The the entire um, you know one of the main proponents of Enochian magic is the summoning of angels and demons, uh, and of course you know Enoch talked to both. Um, Enoch spoke to um, both angels and demons that comes out of the book of Enoch so for D to name his sort system of sorcery after Enoch um, you know I mean I mean that, that that's obviously not a coincidence um, and you know has to come out of the book of Enoch um, you know I mean I mean that to me seems irrefutable and you know you combine that with the whole thing with Walter Raleigh and then you combine it with the fact that D had this huge library but I mean you know you know I mean you know yeah. D, D definitely is a source candidate for this thing but no I mean yeah Enochian magic very dangerous um, you know talking to angels and demons um, you know you'll find this obviously being carried on in modern times by groups such as the Golden Dawn the OTO um, and you know like I said even Freemasonry has this Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial which um, completely you know like I said is incorporating components of the uh, Ethiopian Enoch for the sake of listeners out there who may have not read your book yet and who don't know the story, give us just a nutshell of the discovery of the um, manuscript in Ethiopia. Well, right. Um, the, 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 the book, um, there, there is a man named James Bruce, um, who is a, I believe, who is a Freemason. In fact, I'm certain he is. Um, he was um, yes, touring Ethiopia. Said, yes. Yes. He was touring Ethiopia and um, discovered um, three books. I think there was more than three books, but he returns um, to Europe with um, three books, uh, three copies of the Book of Enoch. Um, I cannot recall off the top of my head if these books are in Greek or Latin. Um, and the three books, he keeps one of them for himself. Um, he deposits another in a library in France, in Paris, I believe. Um, uh, it was a library in France. I'm saying Paris, but it was a library in France. And then the third, probably most famous copy, goes to the Bodleian Library at Oxford University. Um, this is 1773, um, when he comes back to Europe with these books. Um, up until 1773, the Book of Enoch, one Enoch, um, is, is out of Western civilization. Um, it's been reported that the last two people, um, or at least possibly the last two people to have had a copy of the Book of Enoch, or at least parts of it um, were the Christian Church Fathers, Tertullian or Origen, um, which would make sense, actually, especially in the case of Origen, um, yeah. being one of the cultivators of uh, Christianity. But at any rate, um, the, the copy in the Bodleian um, go, goes there, and it, it essentially, uh, Randy, for um, it, it goes into the basement and essentially collects dust until 1821, 
when it's finally translated into English. So, again, you have the Book of Enoch um, remaining off the pages of Western civilization, essentially from the 2nd, 3rd century up until 1821. Um, but again, the, the, the thesis and thrust of Royal Arch of Enoch was to document this anomaly that um, this high degree, as it was being put, put together in Paris, France, in, um, seven, in the 1740s, was uh, incorporating elements of this lost book. So historically, this book was lost, but it was being preserved down through history by Freemasonry. What, what do you believe was the catalyst for that? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't think that was the case at all. Oh, okay. Um, no, um, what 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 happened was, um, I I I think I'll answer your question this way. I mean, I think the book was being preserved by in, in like a hermetic tradition. I mean, you could definitely you know throw the Freemasons into these like secret groups, such as like like you mentioned, like the Rosicrucians, the Cathars, the Gnostics. I mean, I yeah. do believe that there were copies that were being passed down in like a hermetic tradition sort of way. Um, but what what you had happening with Freemasonry, um, modern day Freemasonry as it exists today, was established in London, England, um, on June twenty fourth, seventeen seventeen. Now, granted, I know that there was Masonic lodges existing prior to that um, in England, in Scotland, in the continent of Europe. Um, but my, you know, you know, I mean, that, that's irrefutable. I don't dispute that. I mean, we know in the 1600s, people like e Elias Ashmole talked about being initiated in the Freemasonry. But modern day Masonry, as it exists today, um, true birthday is 1717, um, June 1717, um, and this is when you have the birth of the first three degrees, the Grand Lodge in England. Um, the high degrees come later, um, and 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 the, the, these come out of Paris, France, um, in the 1740s, 1750s. Um, Blue Lodge Freemasonry is born in 1717. Um, the High Degrees, um, which is originally, the, the original High Degree body is called the Rite of Perfection, and it consists of 25 um, High Degrees. Are you still there? I think I might have lost you. No, I'm here. Oh, no, you're here. Okay. Um, the, the, the 25 High Degrees are, um, and this is this is what is incorporating the Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial, is this High Degree system, 25 Degrees known as the Rite of Perfection, um, and this, this system is being developed by the Jesuits um, in Paris, France, to destroy England. So you have, it's part of the counter, the high degrees are born out of the Counter-Reformation, which is this entire Jesuit-led operation to undermine England and the British monarchy. And, and they, they're using Freemasonry and Freemasonic subterfuge um, as part of this, uh, you know, in, in developing this high degree system, um, you know, to, to undermine England and undermine Blue Lodge Freemasonry. Um, so, you know, whoever was developing this, this Royal Arch ceremonial, you know, you could have a copy coming from John Dee. Um, you know, the Jesuits at the time were very interested in mysticism and the occult. So uh, the fact that a copy didn't could have fallen into their hands is very likely. You get into uh, a copy going into the Vatican Library that was unknown, very likely. Um, you had Jesuit priests who were into this material. Um, the Jesuit priest Athanathus Kircher, who was very mystical, um, he, he once owned a copy of the Voynich Manuscript, or owned the copy of the Voynich Manuscript at uh, Yale University. Um, this also was allegedly written by Dr. John Dee. Um, so you have this very heavy Jesuit um, theme of mysticism, Kabbalah, um, apotheosis going into this high degree ceremonial, which was originally attended um, as, a, as part of Jesuit subterfuge, counter reformation trickery to essentially undermine Blue Lodge Freemasonry and England. Yeah, somebody in our chat room just said, said the Jesuits are illuminous. Is that what you're saying? No. Um, the, 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 the Society of Jesus, um, the, uh, uh, since the Council of Trent, they were charged with the Counter-Reformation, right. which, is, which is basically um, destroy England. Um, so you have England um, in 1717 um, presenting, um, you, know, you know, creating Blue Lodge Freemasonry. It's, it's deism. It has a Christian component, but it's very Protestant. Um, it, it's very Whiggery, which was um, Parliament over monarchy and no stort, um, no more Catholic storts on the throne. And of course, the the high degrees. For me, I'm just condensing the answer for time for time consideration. But really, the high degrees. The, the better, the best way to think about it is, it's the um, the high degree system was originally designed as a vehicle to restore um, the Roman Catholic storts back to the throne of England. It, it doesn't work. Um, you, you know, and you'll, you'll find this again um, 
in another high degree body. Um, you, you may have heard of something called the right of strict observance, which yeah. was, um, yeah, which was created by this guy, um, the Baron von Hund. I mean, he talked about this guy, the unknown superior. Um, mm -hmm. And who is this unknown superior? Um, the unknown, this is well known. The unknown superior is a guy named Charles Edward Stewart, um, better known to history as Bonnie Prince Charlie. And, and oh. the, the, entire, the entire purpose of these high degree bodies, the right of perfection, was really to undermine England and to use them as subterfuge to, dis to restore a stort Roman Catholic pretender back to the throne. Um, it doesn't work, of course. Um, and what eventually happens is the high degrees become very popular on their own, um, and they become extremely popular in the United States. By the time they get to the United States, um, the Jesuits seem to be out of it. Um, they kind of have a life of their own after, after, after the threat of any sort of stort restoration had passed. Um, the high degrees sort of take off and, and really, for lack of a better word, have a have you know have a lot, life of their own. Um, and by the time they get to the shores of America, um, there really seems to be no Jesuit influence behind it anymore, or or machinery behind it. Well, one of the problems as well as you know, Robert, is terminology and Illuminism, Illuminati, um, <clears throat> cabal. These are all terms that kind of today, especially on the internet kind of funnel through uh, a lot of conspiracy theories and and you know there are conspiracy theories and then there are the woo woo conspiracy theories um, but in terms of, of of illumination is that a term that we associate with Freemasonry I, I heard you use the term ascension earlier and to me that seemed to be more in line with and I'm, I'm, I'm going here for semantics for a reason to try and clarify some things. So, Illuminism is what compared to Freemasonry, or is it part of Freemasonry? Well, right. Uh, well, I mean, within Freemasonry, what I'm talking about is in this third degree. Um, I be, you, what, what you have going on is the symbolic death, and 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 and, um, and you, you know the, the candidate undergoes the symbolic death, and he's brought back to life. He's resurrected. The the idea is. Um, he 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 his his divine spark has been lit. I suppose it's a form of Gnosticism, is what it really is. It's best described as Gnostic ascensio. He has ascended to his divine awakening. Um, is probably the, let me put it that way. Um, and and in doing so, the 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 theory or the philosophy behind this death and resurrection is that he could go out and effect some sort of positive change in the world. In the in the high degrees. Um, this is a little different, you know, where you have this very heavy Roman Catholic um, influence. You have concepts of papal monarchy. You have concepts of um, Kabbalah, um, of, of apotheosis, when, again, where the candidate beholds the name of God and in doing so becomes godlike. And the idea is this gave the candidate warrant to rule. Um, and this, this comes straight out of um, the cultivation of the Royal Arch of Enoch Ceremonial, um, in the early days of the United States. The guy behind this is a man named Thomas Smith Webb. You will not hear this guy's name mentioned on any conspiracy shows. Um, and he's probably one, I mean, he put, he makes Albert Pike look like a kindergarten student when it comes to Freemasonry um, in the United States. But of course, Pike gets all the attention because he uses the word Lucifer. Um, yeah. The Illuminati, um, the, the Illuminati comes on the scene um, in 1776. Um, and and to, what, what, I, what my take on the Illuminati is, it's, very, it, it's, it's not Masonic per se. I mean, it's Masonic-like. Um, and and what, what you clearly have going on here is, again, um, this seems to be more evidence of Jesuit counter-reformation trickery going on. Yeah. Um, in, in 1773, three years before the Illuminati is founded, the Society of Jesus um, is put out of business for their occultism um, and political meddlings. Um, and, and three years later, you have the Illuminati come on the scene. Um, it's interesting that I believe that's the original name that Ignatius of Loyola wanted to give the Society of Jesus was the Illuminati. The Pope at the time didn't like the name. Um, Weishaupt and Xavier Zwack, who are the two leading Illuminati members, are both Je all, all the guys in the Illuminati, all the leaders, were trained by the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they use a lot of Jesuit um, subterfuge. Um, a, man, a, man, a man by the name of um, Baron Kanigi, um, Adolf Kanigi joins it. Um, he's a Freemason, um, and he gets, he, he, he's really into it, and he gets a ton of um, Freemasons to join the Illuminati, and he thinks this is great. This is this new form of uh, Freemasonry. 
that's going to bring equality and it's anti-monarchy. Um, he leaves it soon thereafter, and he, he writes a treatise and says, this is just the Jesuits under, under another name. Don't buy into this. This is just all straight Jesuitism. So the Illuminati um, seems to be, again, another one of these um, Jesuit counter-reformation tricks. Um, they, they, they seem to be off the history books by the end of the wars of Napoleon, um, and that would make sense because um, at, at the end of the wars of Napoleon, the, the Society of Jesus is restored, um, and, and but they definitely have an influence. I mean, you know, you, you, will, you will definitely find an Illuminati um, incursion into the United States. Uh, this is mainly being done through a man by the name of DeWitt Clinton. Um, he's someone else who has been written off the history books. Yeah. But um, you know, you know, th th they're they're important. You'll find Illuminism in the Carbonari of Giuseppe Manzini. You'll find the Illuminati in the Skull and Bone Society at Yale University. Um, you know, I mean, they're important. I mean, you'll find um, the the character in um, uh, in Mozart's Masonic uh, opera, The Magic, the Magic Flute. Flute. Um, yeah. Yeah, Zoroastro. Um, mm -hmm. He is based on a character or on a real life person named Ignaz von Born. Um, who was Mozart's Masonic um, master, and uh, von Born was the head of the Illuminati Temple in Vienna, Austria. So you know, there, there's the Illuminati. There's an Illuminati influence on Mozart. So um, they're important, no question about it. Was Mozart also a Mason? Oh yes. Um, yeah, I mean, oh my goodness, uh, Mozart was in um, was a Freemason. You will find. Um, lots of Masonic themes in, 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 in the works of Mozart. Um, the Magic Flute um, has a lot of Masonic um, Illuminati, even um, symbolism and themes. Um, Mozart, of course, um, wrote the music um, to, the, to the Magic Flute. The libretto was written by another Freemason named Emanuel Schickander. Um, and, and so you had two Freemasons behind the Magic Flute. Um, and yes, Mozart was a Freemason. That kind of um, pulls us into where we're going to go in the next segment as well, because we're going to start to look at, um, well, the symbolism and uh, occult influences. And again, uh, the term occult is, you know, it's got a dark meaning, but at the same time, what it really means is hidden. Do you, do you want to comment on that a little bit before, as we're, we're kind of coming up on break point here, so... Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, the word occult um, definitely can t uh, tend to scare some people. It doesn't scare me. It definitely, it comes from the Latin word occultist. You're absolutely right, Randy. It means hidden. Um, it, it, it has a sinister connotation to it. You know, people, you know, who hear the word, they think of witchcraft or, you know, demonism, things like that. Um, the, the, word, uh, the word means hidden. For me, it means hidden but mysterious. Um, to me, there is definitely... Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't describe a secret room per se in the bo in the basement of a high school um, boiler room as occult per se. I mean, although it may be hidden, um, it, it, it really doesn't have that connotation. It means more mysterious and mystical and numinous um, to me, you know. And mysterious is probably the better word. But I, 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 it can it can denote evil. It can denote um, positive also. Um, you know, symbols. Um, are you know that have hidden meaning? Uh, the symbol doesn't have to be negative all the time. It, it can be negative. It has to deal with the um, creator's uh, intention. I mean, f for example, um, just and I'll wrap up on this. Um, the you know we, we talk we talk earlier about the Masonic rituals. Um, you know, in the third degree, the the the, the death and resurrection of Hiram Abiff. I mean, if, you know, you can just say on its surface, oh, that's all it is. You know, that that's it. Um, but to me, the the the, the ritual has a cult meaning. It has hidden meaning. It has layered meaning. It, 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 we're dealing with um, solar iconography, hidden solar symbolism, hidden Gnostic meaning. So um, I, I don't think it's I, I, it's a word that doesn't scare me. And um, you know, something's occult doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, negative. That's a great way to go. Um, so we're going to take a break at this point. Um, what you're going to see on the break is a video, and this is fundraising month for um, CCN Conscious Consumer Network. And it is an opportunity for you to reach out and support independent media. And um, <clears throat> what we're doing is basically there's a program. It's outlined on the links to the web, at the website and in this video. And you can support CCN and in return uh, be a partaker in uh, all of the high-definition videos from the network since its inception back in January. 
And if we're ready to go with that, that video, we're going to take about a three to five minute break. Come back on the other side of Off Planet TV. Then talk about uh, symbolism and entertainment. Um, look at some major films and uh, basically give you a sense of uh, what is going on in the culture and the influences with my guest, Robert W. Sol Sullivan Esquire. If you really had to make a difference on a large scale with minimal resources, how would you go about it? Have you ever dared to dream of doing that which seems impossible? On a planet steeped with corruption and destruction, the question beckons, how do we change it? Media has a far-reaching impact on people and has been used to manipulate humanity into our current destructive patterns. In order to affect people into moving into constructive patterns of behavior, we need to construct a new paradigm of media. The Conscious Consumer Network has been created with the explicit intention of giving the amazing truth-seeking, solutions-orientated, alternative media a place to fully realize their true potential with a cutting-edge, high-tech professional media platform being made available to use at no cost to the broadcaster. In turn, some of the greatest freedom-seeking hearts and souls of our time have realized the true potential of what has been created and have come together to provide their insight and inspiration on CCN. Conscious Consumer Network has become a unique, interactive, information and educational network which provides a free-to-view, live-stream, ultra-high-definition channel to the world and features 25 live shows a week and growing with the addition of multiple language broadcasts. CCN has features comparable with mainstream media such as being able to pause and rewind broadcasts whilst being live-streamed. Catch up on this or previous broadcasts, now available from CCN High Definition Downloads. You can now purchase a high definition download of your favorite CCN show from ethymarket.com. Support free and independent media by becoming a monthly pledger. This can be done with a monthly pledge of 10 euros, which will allow you unlimited access to CCN's high definition downloads, which hosts a back catalog of over 250 shows, which have been aired since the launch of CCN on the 1st of January, 2015. In order to keep CCN free of corporate sponsorship and advertising, CCN has launched the Pledge 300 campaign. This is a realistic goal with the hopes of securing a minimum of 300 people who will each pledge 10 euros a month. With this number, we can continue to grow and operate and potentially expand into a second foreign language channel. Without it, CCN will simply not be able to function without succumbing to corporate sponsorship and advertising. Help keep alternative media in the hands of the people. We thank you for supporting free and independent media.
isolation Cause you're biting your tongue You spent all that time stuck in silence Afraid you'll say something wrong If no one ever hears it How you gonna learn your song So come on, come on Come on, come on You gotta I'm not afraid 
And we are back from the break. Hope that wasn't too long for you. I want to give a shout out tonight to the chat room at offplanetmedia.net. Um, you guys uh, are engaging with each other and engaging with the show. I see that. Some good questions there. Um, somebody asked about posting links. Let's do this. There's one link I want to get out tonight, and that is uh, for Robert to let you know where you can find him because I believe he has a ton of information on his website, including a forum, but I'll let him tell you about it. Robert, tell people where they can find you, my friend. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, the easiest way to find me is just go to my website. There are links to buy the books. Um, it's www.robertwsullivaniv.com. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. So it's all connected, all lowercase, www.robertwsullivaniv.com. Um, there are links there to buy the books. Go to my YouTube channel, watch videos I produce, listen to other podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook fan pages, information about me. Um, I have a forum where I post things. If you're registered, you can leave comments behind. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everything is right there. Upcoming events I'm doing, um, that all that goes in there. Again, www.robertwsullivaniv.com. And the links are right there. Um, so uh, throughout the show tonight, you have the links to go to Robert's site. And, you know, this is a big subject. We can't, we're not even really even scratching the surface tonight on, on this. And <laughs> means I got to get you back and we can delve into this a little bit more. Um, just to kind of maybe close out the subject of uh, the Arch of Venoch. The symbolism behind the arch is intentionally architectural. Does it have a deeper meaning, the arch itself? We see the arch everywhere. Uh, I can drive across the river here. The capital city of Pennsylvania is Harrisburg. There are arches there. There are um, uh, what we would call the um, the monolithic structures. Um, there's a lot of ancient Egyptian architecture that's associated as well. I'm assuming that all of this architecture is kind of integrated in the masonry as well. Yeah, yes. Um, part of masonry is sacred geometry, mathematics. Um, in, in masonry, the term for God is grand geometrician. Um, and and so, so you will find, and you know, of course, masonry, um, the operative masons, um, there are two types of masons, operative and, you know, uh, uh, what. Yeah, that's it. There you go. Yeah. Um, that's how to be the speculative. The operative guys, you know, and it's the incorporation of things like the Vesica Pisces Golden Ratio. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a huge part of masonry is, you know, the actual construction. Um, and, and just to answer your question, the, the, the arch, um, the original arch is the rainbow um, in, in the Old Testament where the God, God as a symbol to not destroy the world by fire anymore, um, create the rainbow. That's the original arch. In, in masonry, um, the arch ties into, in, in, in the royal arch ceremonial and the ritual, um, in the subterranean hidden underground vault where the secret name of God is, um, Enoch conceals it under nine archways. Um, it's, it's placed under nine arches. Um, that, that's why the, it's called the Royal Arch of Enoch. That's, uh, the, the, the treasure is hidden under nine archways. Um, but you know, to make a long story short, yes, sacred, sacred geometry. Um, you'll find it in Washington, D.C., um, so it's a lengthy um, conversation, but um, yeah, I mean that that definitely ties into Freemasonry. So now we kind of delve into this other area, the impact of, well, I'll say Freemasonry, but it's it's much broader than that. Um, this encoding in our in our entertainment. We talked a little bit earlier about Mozart. Um, I've seen it in music, for instance, um, even the. Firebird Street, which is sweet, which is Stravinsky, has overtones to this as well. But in modern films, especially, and we're, when I use the term modern, I guess it's all encompassing because we're going to go back in history quite a bit here, including discussing The Wizard of Oz, which I think is one of the most, that, that, that movie is just a fountainhead of symbolism on so many levels. Um, Introduce the subject and your uh, title of your second book and the thesis behind that, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, but my second book um, is titled um, Cinema Symbolism, A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. And this book was born out of the final chapter 
of um, the Royal Arch of Enoch book, which, um, like I said at the first part of the hour, was I wanted to talk about some of this very hidden Masonic solar themes I was seeing in movies such as National Treasure, um, Da Vinci Code, Excalibur, which is the solar legend that we've been talking about a little bit, um, with National Treasure. Um, for example, I mean, some of it's overt. Many people may not be, be aware of this, but the first National Treasure movie is actually a Masonic ritual. Um, that's the Royal Arch ceremonial on screen. Um, it's the recovery of the Masonic treasure in the subterranean vault beneath the holy ground. Um, that's exactly the National Treasure movie. So if you want to watch the Royal Arch of Enoch ritual on film, watch National Treasure. Um, and this just really fascinated me. I mean, I, I took, you know, I mean, I, I was seeing it in, in a, you know, where, where I knew I wasn't a coincidence. I mean, I was definitely seeing this, and I could tell the symbolism and, and, and this very adroitly concealed, you know, themes um, were definitely being put in the movies. So when I was writing Royal Arch and I was writing this final chapter, I was limiting myself to just talking, you know, like about the Being There movie, which again is a solar allegory or the national treasure. But I was seeing the same sort of material, you know, not necessarily Masonic per se, but, you know, archetypes and, you know, you know, numerology and, and mystery religions and, you know, um, just symbolism and alchemy um, and Gnosticism in, in, in movies um, that wasn't necessarily Masonic. So I thought, okay, um, I can't have this Royal Arch of Enoch book go on forever. I'll end it with this this final chapter, and I'll just write a new book off of this, where we'll delve into some of these, you know, other themes. Some are Masonic, granted, but um, some of them del delve into these other topics. Um, and this this is um, cinema symbolism, where um, I, I I really you know really went to work, and um, you know where where we talked about at the beginning of the show, where uh, when I was studying at Oxford, I kind of took this 20 years of experience. Um, this 20-year period, beginning in 1992, to write the Royal Arch and research Royal Arch of Enoch, where I was, you know, getting into the occult and mysticism and masonry and secret societies and hermeticism and, you know, hidden history and things like that. What I kind of did was I turned that 20 years on Hollywood, um, for lack of a better word, and um, out came cinema symbolism, where I talk about these occult, um, very adroitly uh, hidden themes um, in modern cinema, um, and, and I am 100% convinced. Um, after seeing it enough that um, we are well beyond the coincidence level here um, and this is in, intentionally placed I just just I don't really I know I know there is a wide um, range of thought out there that this is mind control and evil and this and that um, I don't really see it that way I see it more as you know kind of like what we were talking about earlier is a form of sacred architecture or sacred geometry where to me it's almost like incorporating um, this material it's giving this this live the celluloid life turning it into like a living piece of artwork so again i don't necessarily see this all as sinister it can be um but i i you know like i said i i just wrote the book from sort of like a a a, a standpoint of you know here's the movie and here's the hidden symbolism and here's the underlying themes going on in it i think a good place to start the conversation is with what i would consider to be Again, the mother load, which is the Wizard of Oz, and yeah. what, what's baked into that that film. I mean, this is a movie with universal appeal. I mean, almost everybody in our culture has seen it at some time. Uh, even very young children grow up, and at some point they have an opportunity to see it. It was run annually on network television in the United States through, I believe, the 1980s, and so you know the wizard of oz kind of is this touchstone and over the years i started to become aware of some of the symbolic aspects of it that were it's actually kind of multi-dimensional so uh somewhere in all of that uh, just kind of riff on that yeah absolutely randy you're 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 100 um the wizard of oz is a, a seminal uh piece when it comes to symbolism um it needs to be pointed out that the man um, who wrote The Wizard of Oz was a man named L. Frank Baum, um, and, and he, he, he wrote the book, um, it was, I want to say, published in 1900, it may have been published in 1901, um, and, and, and he was a member of Madame Blavatsky's Theosophy Movement. Um, but, but you have really, in The Wizard of Oz, I mean, when you say it's multi-leveled, you, you are 100% correct. Um, you have, one, you know, just off the bat, this, this idea of what you would call, you know, this profane explanation where this is just about a farm girl who goes to this magical land, has this adventure, um, kind of gets to know herself, 
um, meets these magical friends, um, defeats an evil witch, goes home, the end, have a nice life. You know, this is the profane explanation. <laughs> that's, um, and then that's, yeah. you know, and, and that's important because when it comes to symbolism, there's always, a, there, there's always that. Um, there's always this base explanation that can be given. Um, and every Masonic author since time immemorial will say, when it comes to symbolism in this material, there's always this profane explanation just for the masses. But of course, we delve into the Wizard of Oz, we're going to find two very much deeper level um, levels of symbolism going on. Um, and one is more well known than the other. Um, the one is a whole political allegory in the Wizard of Oz that Baum yeah. encoded, yeah, which is essentially um, the political, economic, social life of the United States of America from around 1894 to 1900. Um, and again, you know, I'll just touch on this briefly, where you have the Wizard of Oz um, is a representation of President William McKinley, um, who wanted to use um, the gold standard and something called and, and silver, which was embodied in the free silver movement, um, to pay back green paper money. This is why the yellow brick road or the gold standard leads to Emerald City, which is green. It's gold standard leading to the creation of paper money. Um, you have um, the idea of the American farmer who is the uh, scarecrow, the American laborer is tin man. Um, the, 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 the tin man is immobile. He can't move. This, this symbolizes this depression that happened in the mid-1890s where hordes of droves of American laborers were laid off um, and felt worthless. Um, and, of course, the, the tin man, the laborer, is immobile. What gets him moving again? It's oil. They have to oil him up to get him back to work, to get him moving. This was a representation of um, the, the Rockefeller Standard Oil who put many laborers back to work. Therefore, the tin man has to get moving by the oil. You know, the oil gets him back. And then, of course, you have the two little dancing groups, um, the Lullaby League and the um, Lollipop Gill. The Lullaby League is the sleep. This is why they're asleep but waking up. This is the women's suffrage movement that was becoming um, that, that was becoming very um, – that was waking up at the time, quite literally. And the Lollipop Gill is laborized union, which began to develop at the same time. So you have this um, very deep – um, political allegory going on in the Wizard of Oz, but then you also have this, uh, uh, you know, and this one's not well known, and this comes out of Baum's involvement with theosophy, is you have this entire, um, what you would call initiation into the mystery tradition um, neo-gnostic um, you know, even quote-unquote Masonic theme um, in Wizard of Oz, where you have this farm girl, Dorothy Gale, um, she goes up this uh, you know, the winding staircase of Freemasonry, up the tornadoes, you know uh you know, the tornado um, receives ascension, goes to this magical land, um, interacts with these three um, figures. One seeks one seeks wisdom, one seeks fortitude, and the other seeks courage, which Madame Blavatsky said you have to have it to um, be initiated into the mystery tradition. Dorothy walks on the golden path of religion, which is the yellow brick road. Excuse me, the yellow brick road. What does that lead her to? the Gnostic Demiurge, the false messiah, the evil wizard, who's a phony, you know, he's scary and intimidates people with his worship by being this evil figurehead, but it's just this harmless little old man behind the curtain, there's nothing to him, this comes straight out of, um, the, you know, Blavatsky's Theosophy Society, um, and then of course Dorothy um, has her, her divine epiphany, um, her, her awakening, um, her Gnostic revelation, which for her is there's no place like home. Um, and eventually she returns home, wiser for it, um, awakened, and of course none of the farmhands understand her or understand her awakening, but she gets it, but none of them can understand it. Um, and again, you'll find, you'll, you'll find these, um, the, these Gnostic themes um, in, in The Wizard of Oz. You have her walking on the golden path of religion. You have the two, um, one, one aspect that's very, very interesting is you have the two witches um, who are the white witches who use the white magic um, they're of the north and south. They're the ones who want to help Dorothy. Um, in, in the movie, there's only one of them. In the book, there's two. It's of the north and south. Then you have the two evil witches, the two witches who use the black magic. They're of the east and west. Um, they're left and right. Um, that represents stagnation. You don't receive ascension by moving sideways. You only receive ascension and wisdom by moving up the ladder, up the ladder of Minerva, up the ladder of Jacob. Um, Gnostic Ascensio. That's why the two positive witches who want to assist Dorothy are of the north and south, representing Gnostic Ascension. Um, and the two evil women who want to keep her static are east and west, left and right. You don't go anywhere moving left and right. So within The Wizard of Oz, you have this really three-level um, approach to the book and the film. 
Um, you have, and I have a whole chapter of it in the book. I'm, I'm going over it very briefly here. There's more to it than this. But you, of course, have the profane explanation. Then you have the political allegory, which is a very important one. And then you have this entire Gnostic um, mystery tradition um, symbolism going on inside the Wizard of Oz. It's a fascinating study. Um, and it's, it's, I, I could ask about it a lot, but um, I, I really tried to detail it a lot in the book. But yes, you're right, Randy. Um, Wizard of Oz, very multi level, very intense. What do you think the average person took away from the Wizard of Oz? And, and more, more to the point, was the intent to, to subliminally introduce these themes, do you think? I mean, I know subliminals weren't known at the time that movie was made, but it seems as though there's a type of communication that occurs, and it is part of the esoteric tradition to communicate in symbols and things that are cloaked that operate on the subconscious level. So based on that premise, what do you see was the subconscious message that that film was attempting to communicate on the mass level to the people who are going to watch well, it? As you say, the profane. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, 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 I, I mean, on a subconscious level, I think he's trying to convey that this movie, you know, the, these deeper themes of this movie. Um, but like you said, you know, many people aren't aware of this. I mean, this is one of the reasons I wrote the book was to kind of explain these multi-layered um, symbolism. I mean, I think the average person who watches it, um, you know, you know, who, who has no, you know, knowledge of this material is just going to watch it and, you know, get your profane explanation with it. Um, you know, it's just, oh, this is just about a girl who goes on this magical adventure. I mean, you know, it, it's, 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 it's the same theme as the, it's the Alice in Wonderland. It's the same story. Instead of going up the tornado, she goes down the rabbit hole to receive wisdom. Um, it's Jack and the Beanstalk. It's it's the same story up up the magical ladder, up the up the you know uh, the magic um, beanstalk, up the magic ladder to the magical land that's ruled over by the evil monster, the ogre, the demiurge. It's it's this it's the same Gnostic theme. Um, and I definitely think um, you know when you're dealing with Gnosticism and and these ancient religions and these ancient mystical religions, um, you know you read the works of Carl Jung. Um, and, and, you know, read about psychology and psychiatry, um, you get into themes of the collective unconscious and how our unconscious mind is tapped into this. And we're not consciously aware of it, but our unconscious mind is. Um, and it's almost like you said, it's, it's, it's appealing to our, because it's appealing to our unconscious mind, we're not aware of it. Um, and I do believe, um, make no mistake, I mean, if you want to call it mind control, I really don't view it that way, but I definitely think a lot of times these filmmakers, I mean, are definitely tweaking with the uh, collective unconscious. Well, I, I, don't consider, aware. I don't consider mind control to necessarily be a bad thing. I mean, I don't know how many people know or remember back in the 70s, there was a, a system called silver mind control that was about basically being able to harness your own mind. Mind control, when it's exercised morally and um, by permission... I'll put it that way because there's forms of mind control out there that are obviously coercive and violent is a good thing because basically we communicate in very subliminal ways both between ourselves as social animals but the symbols are important even in communicating with ourselves the subconscious going into the Jungian thing of the archetypes and um, the idea that there are these great symbolic works that operate on on uh, a subtle level. Oh, I agree with you, and I don't think it's necessarily negative either. I mean, there there is this thought. There there is a lot out there. I mean, you know, and I, I mean, you know, you talk about you know stuff on the internet. I mean, you know, the, you know, you you'll read these pages where these movies. Um, you know, the whole purpose of Hollywood is to mind control you, and you know. I mean, I just don't really buy into that. I think I think it's more appealing to your collective unconscious. But I mean, I think I, I don't think that's necessarily a negative. I mean, you also have to remember this too, Randy. I mean, I think it is intentional most of the time. But you know, when you get into the idea of the collective unconscious and with young, um, you know, you have filmmakers who may be incorporating this stuff and they're not aware of it. I mean, they're subject to this thing too. Exactly. Um, exactly. You know, I mean, and that's a, that's an interesting study. Also, I, I point out. A couple examples of that but I do believe like with Balm and you know you get into George Lucas with Star Wars and then you certainly get into the Matrix um, with the Wachowski um, siblings you yeah. know they you know you know I mean this, this stuff is definitely being used and what to me is it's communicating another story to you that's a that you, your conscious mind is being entertained 
by the movie on the screen, but your subconscious mind is being entertained by the Gnosticism and the ancient symbols and the mysteries and the symbolism and the archetype that you're seeing. So it's almost like a two, you know, this is this is appealing to your prof profanity and the other's pro appealing to the esoteric side of you. But what's fun is when your conscious mind becomes aware of the esotericism, that's why I wrote the book is to point this stuff out because, I mean, it is incredible in some instances the, the level that these guys will go to incorporate this material. Let's flip over to another epic um, and again, another touchstone that most people have seen, and that's Frankenstein. Oh, right. Well, I mean, Frankenstein is another one. The, the movie in of it itself, um, that's really a movie that has more of a, an occult theme to it um, that really hidden symbols. But what you're dealing with with Frankenstein, and you have this also with Dracula and the Wolfman also, um, you know, you get into the, the traditional monsters, you know, of Universal Studios. I get asked all the time, oh, is all this stuff, you know, just the product of the last 15 years? No, it is not. Um, you know, we just talked about the Wizard of Oz. Um, the, you know, the, the, the works of, the, you know, the Bram Stokers of the world, the Mary Shelley, you know, Frankenstein's monster um, is, is Kabbalah. It's a Kabbalistic golem. Um, that's exactly, exactly what it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's an inanimate um, life. Um, it's it, it's imbued with human personality, um, and really Frankenstein's monster is probably the most famous cabalistic golem in history. Um, other cabalistic, you know, you know, when I say the word cabalistic, I'm talking about Jewish magic. Um, the the golem is, is is a Jewish creation, and of course Kabbalah is the Jewish mystery school. Um, you know that that you know that this this this, this material um, comes from. Um, read read, read uh, Kabbalah by Gershom Shlom um, is what I would direct people to. Um, that's one of the authorities. He gets a whole he gets into a whole thing on um, Kabbalistic golems. But yeah, I mean, I mean, my goodness gracious, yeah, Frankenstein's monster um, is probably the most famous um, uh, golem in history. Um, other other others that fall into this category, you know, it, it's it's an inanimate object that's imbued with human life, making it human like. Um, so, so a, a, a fan or something, or a, a, you know, a Coke bottle that comes to life and just blows across the floor—that doesn't count. Other, other cabalistic golems, Frankenstein's monster aside, um, uh, Edward Scissorhands uh, is one. Um, believe it or not, Smurfette um, from the Smurfs is a golem. Oh, there's a whole uh, thing going on with the Smurfs. I had somebody. Uh, actually engage me in a conversation one night and regale me with the details about the Smurfs and the symbolism that goes into that. Oh, sure. The Smurfs have um, loads of meaning to them. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, you have the, you, you have, again, um, with the Smurfs are somewhat similar to um, the Wizard of Oz where you have a political allegory going on where the, the Smurfs are this perfected communist society. I mean, they all wear the same clothing. They all live in the same housing. Um, they all do communal work without pay. They all live rent free. It's the perfect communist society. The guy who's in charge of this is Papa Smurf, who looks none other than like Karl Marx, um, who wears the red, the red of the communists, um, and even wears the red Phrygian hat of the proto communists, the sans culottes from the French Revolution. Um, and then you know you have the the idea that um, the Gargamel character is sort of, you can look at Gargamel as two ways. You can look at him as the materialistic West, um, you know, the United States. I mean, Gargamel is constantly um, trying to perfect gold. So you can look at it as the materialism of the West, um, who is, you know, the arch enemy of the communists um, in the Cold War. But you could also look at um, as, as Gargamel as the Nazis, um, you know, the guy in the black robes who lives in the little, you know, you know hovel, uh, the German-like hovel, has the, um, you know, this is, you know, paralleling the SS, you know, has the secret vault in the basement with the grand grimoire in it, um, has the, you know, you know, this is paralleling the SS, they were all into the occult. The the, 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 the cat is Azrael, um, that's the god of death in a lot of folklore, um, and, you know, he's always kind of trying to undermine the communists um, and, and, you know, destroy the communists, which is, of course, what Nazi Germany was trying to do, and the West. So you have this political allegory going on with the Smurfs, but then you also have this magical, you know, mystical occult themes where you have, you know, Gargamel trying to transmute gold, um, and he, he kidnaps a Smurf in one episode to, to, to use it to perfect the Philosopher's Stone. Um, the Smurfs, uh, you know, Gargamel's library is nothing but, you know, alchemy sets 
He's got the, the, the vault in the basement where he keeps the grand grimoire, his magic spell book. Um, he uses this to turn a lump of clay into Smurfette, um, which is the female Smurf. Um, the original plan for Gargamel with Smurfette was he sends her into the um, perfected communist village to create a fifth column and destroy the Smurfs, um, you know, to, to undermine them, to cause chaos and anarchy. Um, Papa Smurf actually figures this out, and he uses the white magic to turn Smurfette into... When, when Smurfette appears, she kind of looks frankenstein -ish. She has the flat forehead, you know, kind of the, the long black hair, kind of... Kind, you could see the, the, the cartoonist was going for the Boris Karloff Frankenstein. Um, but, when, you know, of course, when, when, when Papa Smurf weaves the white magic, that's when he, she, he, she turns Smurfette into the, you know, the Smurfette with the blonde hair and the white high heels, and she's welcomed among the Smurfs at that point. But, yeah, the Smurfs are great. You know, I get asked... Um, you know, Walt Disney, you know, you get into this material with children's movies with uh, Walt Disney. I mean, my goodness, Walt Disney certainly has a lot going That's in replete it. with uh, it. The, the Disney yeah, material. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It actually does get kind of dark at some point. There's a whole bunch of subliminals in Disney films that are rather sexual and I would even say inappropriate. But, you know, the Disney thing, if you, I, I remember one of the first films I saw as a kid animated was the Disney production of The Sword and the Stone. And all of the magic and wizardry that went into that. I mean, it's a marvelous movie. It still is. But it was encoded with a lot of ritual and a lot of um, what I come to realize now as being kind of almost indoctrinating in terms of magic arts. Oh, sure. You have... Um... You know, the, the Disney material, this is something I'm working on in my new book. I'm actually writing a sequel to Cinema Symbolism now where I'm taking on the Disney material. But, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, the National Treasure movie is Walt Disney. You get into, I mean, um, with, with Disney, you have um, the Witch Mountain movies um, have a lot going on in them. You get into the animated movies. I mean, you're right. You, know, you get into things like Sleeping Beauty has a lot of uh, very religious overtones in them. Even the one they just made now, Maleficent, with Angelini Jolie, who is, you know, who who is the villain um, in Sleeping Beauty, but they turn her into the good guy. I mean, and, and you know, she she's sort of the Enochian demon. I don't know if you you've seen Maleficent yet. Um, she starts out as the good guy, but she gets her wings clipped. You know, this is the fallen angel sin syndrome. She she has wings, but they get clipped off. So now she's the fallen angel. She's for the fallen demon, um, and then she turns to the dark side. So you have that whole thing going on in Maleficent, and then of course you know you get into the darker aspects of Wiz uh, excuse me of Disney of Disney. Um, you have uh, Fantasia, I mean, where you have a knight on Bald Mountain, which is an ode to, which is basically a satanic hymn, um, yeah. and then of course you have Mickey Mouse dancing around using the magic, you know, the, the capitalistic magic to make the uh, brooms dance around and things like that. So I mean, yeah, my goodness, uh, the, the world of Walt Disney um, is really overloaded uh, with a lot of this material. Well, Hollywood in general, I mean, the, you know, you just look at the whole thing, the whole culture of Hollywood, uh, the wavers of the wood, the wand. Um, Holly is is, is a, 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 a spiritually imbued wood element, and it looks to me like a lot of entertainment in general, not just films, but television, and especially the recording industry, serve as vectors somehow for messages that are being transmitted uh, again into what I would call, I hate the term, collective unconscious. Is that the sense you get as well? Uh, to an extent, yes. I mean, I think, I think though, in these movies, um, you know, I, I, think, I think it's more of their tweet, they're playing with the unconscious mind um, because, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to pick up on some of this imagery. When you pick up on it, uh, the only way I can answer your question is, I mean, I, I, I would say that this material is definitely being in, in, intentionally in place. I, I don't think it's a coincidence this material is appearing um, in these movies. But right. what, what, what is really striking to me is, I mean, is how adroitly concealed some of this material is. And it really is for me, I mean, when, when I was doing cinema symbolism, I mean, you know, I can't tell you how many times. When I was writing the book, I'd have to go back and watch a movie scene, or what? You know, when I'm watching the movie, I have to pause it. Something at the end may reflect something at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Some little number um, that has no meaning at all will have some overwhelming meaning. And it, it's just, 
you know, the, 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 the complexity that these filmmakers go to to incorporate this material. And again, I think on some levels, and I, I think it's really, uh, you know, the idea is that they're transforming um, the celluloid into living artwork. Um, that, that by incorporating this mysticism, it's, you're making more than just a movie. You're making a Da Vinci-like masterpiece. Um, but you know, you know, like I said, Randy, um, this material to me is in, in, in intentionally placed. Um, not all the time, of course, but in, in the movies that I was analyzing, I had seen enough to, to lead me to believe that it was intentionally placed, and um, you know, I was convinced enough to uh, write a book about it. So, from a, a sociological standpoint knowing that this this has been encoded into our well into our culture because it doesn't it isn't even just the entertainment industry i mean you go back and you look at i don't know a pacini opera the shakespeare libretto the whole uh arc of western culture seems to be communicating something and it seems to communicate it on a very wide cultural level so from your standpoint as somebody who's writing about this do you see do you see a thread is what we're seeing right now representative of our culture or predictive of our culture well i i i have documented um i mean you know there is the idea of movies as prophecy um where a movie has predicted something yeah um that is def yeah that is definitely documentable um, I guess you could always craft an argument that with all the movies that are coming out, they're bound to get something right from time to time. I mean, right. I don't to buy into the fact that 9-11 was predicted back in the mid-1980s. Um, but, you know, you have the whole thing with The Matrix with Neo's passport. Um, that's irrefutable. I mean, and that is a disturbing one. But, you know, you have this interest in mysticism and, and, and supernatural themes. I mean, you're absolutely correct. You'll find this in the works. I mean, this predates Hollywood. You'll find it in the works of Mozart. Shakespeare, Richard Wagner, um, you know, I mean, that's absolutely correct. You know, Mary Shelley with, with Kabbalah, Bram Stoker with, with Dracula. So, I mean, you know, the interest in this material, I guess, just part of human nature. I mean, it's always there, and Hollywood is constantly searching around for um, things to make movies about, and, uh, you know, but, but, but I, I guess, you know, you have movies that, you know, can be mystical in nature, um, movies that can be supernatural in nature, you know, uh, like a movie like The Exorcist about a girl being possessed by the devil. But then you look at The Exorcist and you look at the little numbers and codes and things like mm -hmm. that in the background that give this movie, um, this very deeper religious movie that, you know, imbue these characters with different traits. Um, and it's just a fascinating study that, you know, when, when, when I guess it's for me, it was when you, your eyes trained to pick this stuff up you'll start seeing, and this is, again, one of the motivations to write this book was sort of to, to train the person who is reading it to, to say, you know, to pay attention to this stuff. I mean, you know, I, I, I've, I've done interviews and talked to people, and so I've been reading the book, you know, and I've, I've hit a point, I'm like, oh, there's no way that happened in the movie. And sure enough, they'll go through the movie and be like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. You know, I never saw that in there. Um, and, you know, then, then, you know, oh, you're right. You know, now I understand what that movie was. You know, now I understand why the number 33 was behind um, you know, Father Karras and the Exorcist, you know, or why um, the number 88, why the DeLorean has to hit 88 miles to break the space-time continuum. Right. Um, and why the lightning strikes the clock tower at 10.04. It doesn't strike it at 10.03 yeah. or 10.05. It has to be at 10.04. There's a reason for that. Um, and it's just a fascinating study. And um, like I said, I thought enough of it to write this book about it. And, um, you know, I, there's even more. Like I, you know, like I said, uh, I'm writing cinema symbolism too now, which is even more movies than I'm delving into. <laughs> this may not be your bailiwick, but it's kind of mine. Have you looked into the subject of the uh, Batman, the Dark Knight movie, and the pointers there into Sandy Hook? Are you aware of this? Yeah, I mean, I, I was asked about this a couple of weeks ago on a show, on another show okay. I did. Um, well, see, the, here, I mean, I, I, the, there is material going on in the Batman mythology in general. I mean, a lot of the Batman characters are Jungian. You know, you have the whole thing with the conscious ego and the shadow self. You know, you have the Catwoman character as Lilith. You have the Two-Face character as this Roman god Janus. So you'll find a lot of mythology in, in the Batman material. I talk about that. Um, you know, in these arch archetypes in, in, in the cinema book. Um, I, someone asked me about the Sandy Hook thing, and, um, you know, I, I, the, 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 what, what I, I, from what I can tell, this seems to be a coincidence. 
um, and nothing more than that because um, according to what I found out, I had, I had no idea about this. Someone asked me about this about two months ago. I had no idea about it. I went back, I watched the movie, I saw the scene they're talking about, and uh, uh, from what I could research this, when Gotham City was created, and it goes back to one of the earlier comic books, um, and this goes back to the 1940s or 50s or something, um, one of the boroughs of Gotham City is naturally um, uh, New York City, of course, mm. and uh, New York City has the boroughs in it, and um, in the 1950s, one of the boroughs was just named Sandy Hook, um, and it appears to be nothing more than just a, a coincidence. Um, and this went back to the 1950s. I know it turns up in the Dark Knight movie um, with a scene yeah. with Commissioner Gordon. I mean, I guess you could make the argument that maybe, hey, you know, something like that, um, you know, was prophesizing this or someone had inside knowledge. I mean, I don't know, I don't know um, about that. I mean, I know the thing in The Matrix is uncanny with the whole 9-11 reference. Right. Um, you, have the, you know, you have the exact date. But, um, you know, I mean, I guess you could always say it's a coincidence, but, you know, like I said, my, my, my experience is when you start, especially a thing like The Matrix, I mean, those three movies, especially the first one, it's just overloaded with Gnostic um, symbolism. Um, and again, you know, you have the whole idea with the dead and resurrected son man with Neo. But yeah, I mean, I mean, that Sandy Hook thing, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to dispute it. Um, it's definitely in the movie. Um, I, I was also, as someone asked me also, you know, is the collective unconscious, it's inherited, could it be predictive? Um, and I guess, I guess, you know, that's an interesting study of it itself. I guess it's certainly possible, but um, that, that certainly would need uh, more research um, at this point in time. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to drag you down some dark rabbit hole. I wanted no, to get right. your, your take on it because obviously working in this uh, particular area, um, you're looking at films on an analytical basis that, well, quite frankly, the whole concept of film watching, and I realized a long time ago, I listen to movie, I watch movies, I listen to music differently than many people do. Because I do look at symbolism. I grew up, I guess, you know, largely because of my family, I grew up with a background in symbolism. So I look at them that way, and I, I tend to uh, not get slack-jawed watching a movie. I'm paying attention. But the every person in a movie theater, first off, they're in a dark room with flickering lights. They're consuming carbohydrates. They're basically candidates to go into a trance state, so they're not really aware of the content above the base perceptual level of what's visual and auditory. You're watching movies at a different level. Is that something that you developed? Is it something that you always did? Uh, how do you view movies? Yeah, it's something I developed. Um, it, it, it's, it's definitely something I developed. Um, and, and the really the best way for me to answer this question is it really was a product of this 20 years of research I did, which created the Royal Arch. Mm -hmm. And I just took all this wisdom. And, and when I watched the movie, um, really, Randy, it, it, was, it was one of these things where, um, it, it, for starters, it would always take me more than one viewing to start to pick up on this material. Um, that's for starters. I mean, if I just go to a movie theater and watch it, I mean, it's like I'm kind of watching it like, like you said, like everybody else, passively, just for entertainment value. Um, I, I cannot do an analyst of a, I cannot analyze a movie um, unless I have it on Blu-ray or DVD where I can watch it over and over again with a legal pad in front of me when I can pause the movie, go, go you know, jump around, go go to this scene, that scene. Um, that, that's that, that's part of the way I analyze it. Um, I, and I, I just look for different themes um, in movies. I guess that's really the way I start. And, you know, is, is this a religious theme? Um, and you know, it, it, or is, is is you know, is this a you know, are we dealing with an art? You know, archetypes. Are we dealing with um, mysticism? You know, are we dealing with Gnosticism? Um, the name game. Um, you know, the naming of the characters in the movie um, can be a cult. Um, you know, yeah. I I talked about. Um, in, in, in on other shows, um, believe it or not, you know, we talked about symbolism, you know, and some of the symbols um, I've documented with the casting of an actor or actress can be a cult in nature, um, that an actor or an actress was cast for a particular reason. Um, you, you'll find this in the Matrix sequel, and you'll find this in the first Star Wars movie, uh, The Phantom Menace, where um, Anakin Skywalker, the, the actress who played Anakin Skywalker's mother, 
um, was was passed for a specific reason. Um, believe it or not, um, you can actually document um, the release date of a movie. Um, may have an occult purpose. Oh, I've design. seen this numerous times. Yeah, numerologically especially. Yeah, I mean the the one that I can definitely pin down um, was the um, Third Omen movie, um, where 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 um, the Antichrist darkness is finally defeated by the returning sun. Yeah. Um, and of course, the movie released on the vernal equinox when the sun is resurrected from the darkness of winter. Um, it was re released on the vernal equinox of 1981. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a big study here. But I guess to answer your question, I mean, there, I do have a methodology that I do um, when I study these movies, and it just involves this 20 years of research and just watching these movies. And it's just, I'll pick up on stuff. Um, some movies I'll pick up on it faster than others. But I will definitely say that in most cases, um, it definitely takes me more than one viewing to pick it up and, and certainly to pick up on all the themes and, and iconography going on um, inside the movie itself. Um, <clears throat> one more. Let's riff through one more real quick here. The Truman sure. Show. Uh, oh, this, absolutely. The Truman. Yeah, the Truman I, Show with Jim Carrey. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it's just that this is a movie that, on the surface of it, looks like an amusing fantasy kind of. Uh, well, it's it's a little dark on the surface. The more I've watched this movie, and I've seen it at least three times, the darker this movie has become to me in terms of reality. So give us a little bit of a takeaway on what you got out of it. Yeah, the, the Truman Show with Jim Carrey is, um, is, is, is uh, another take on the Gnostic religion. It's the, the idea of the person living in the false world, um, in the material world, which Gnosticism was teaching. Part of the teachings of Gnosticism was rejection of materialism mm -hmm. and the material world. He, he knows that the... Um, the material world he's in is no good, it's bogus. He wants to go on the spiritual quest and abandon the material world. Um, of course, all, all the you know the actors and, and people in this material world are nothing but material. I mean, the, the wife who's phony does nothing but hawk material products. And you have the, the creator of the material world is this demiurge, um, this, this you know, godlike, I mean, he even identifies himself, I'm God. He says, you know, I'm, I'm your creator. I'm at one point to him. I mean, what's this guy's name? Oh, it's Christoph. I mean, what's that symbolizing? You know, Christ. Well, what was Christ? Well, Christ was the creator. He was the carpenter. You know, he, he's the, you know, lesser figure, the, the, the creator figure. Um, and then, of course, you have, I mean, you have some really interesting symbolism going on in this where um, Truman um, leaves. I mean, you, you even have a play on his name. I mean, he's the, you know, Truman. He's the true man, um, T-R-U-E-M-A-N. He's the guy looking for spiritual gnosis, spiritual awakening, being the true man. I mean, how does he do this? He leaves on the boat, um, you know, to, to discover, you know, his, his purpose. The idea of going out on a boat into a body of water to, dis, um, to, the, to discover your meaning of life um, comes out of the Druidic mysteries. This was part of Druidism, um, believe it or not. And, of course, the, the name of the boat that he leaves on, I believe it's the Santa Marie. Um, that's the name of one of um, uh, Columbus's ships, Columbus. of all things. Yeah, that Columbus used to discover the new world in. I mean, and that's what, um, you know, what's Truman looking for, the new world, his, his you know, reality. Um, and then he goes out and he survives the storm. Um, and, of course, he learns it's okay to speak to his creator. And after the storm, he's laying there. Um, I mean, this is, again, you know, the, the, the whole, this ties into the symbolism with the Matrix. He's laying there, laying there on, on the ship cruciform as Christ. Um, but then he discovers um, the, 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 the wall. Um, and then what you do? Well, he gets up and, like Jesus, he ascends into the heaven. He walks up the staircase and leaves into the heavens. I mean, what's Neo do at the end of the Matrix? Um, he, you know, he's dead and resurrected, then flies off into the heavens. What's Jesus do at the end of the New Testament? You know, he's dead and resurrected, and then flies off into the heavens. So you have with the Truman Show um, this entire concept of Gnostic ascension, um, reawakening to define your divine self. Um, the, the idea of the rejection of the material world for the spiritual world, um, which Truman successfully navigates. Um, yeah, a lot, you know, this, this was 1998, that movie came out. Um, you have the year later, 1999, two very seminal Gnostic movies come out. The Truman Show is probably um, one, one uh, is a fantastic Gnostic movie. Um, 1999 saw two other Gnostic movies come out. The Godfather of all Gnostic movies, The Matrix, um, and another Gnostic movie called Fight Club. Um, which, which again deals with these um, same sort of themes. 
um, and I talk about it much more in the book. Yeah, Truman Show is a great movie. Um, a lot going on in it. Read Cinema Symbolism for the full breakdown. I suspect um, after having conversed with you now for nearly two hours, good gosh, we're almost out of time. Um, your background in studying philosophy and law informs your work to a high degree. And I notice that you don't go off into woo-woo land with all of this. You're presenting what I'll call dramatic material and, and more, more than anything else, spiritually esoteric material. How do you balance your spiritual inquiries with um, your background in law? Well, the, 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 what I would say, it's a great question, Randy. The, the, the one thing I would say to you to answer your question is this, is when I do this movie stuff and I do this Masonic symbolism, I mean, you're right. I mean, I try to present what, you know, I can document without getting, you know, into the reptilian shape-shifting, you know, mm -hmm. You know, you know, element of this. Which no, there's some exist. of us I mean, that do that better than others. You should leave that to the professionals, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what, 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 what? I guess my training. I mean, you know, I don't have a problem with that material. Right. I just really don't agree with it. I mean, some of this mm -hmm. material. I mean, when, when you get into the Masonic symbolism and the creation of the USA, I mean, it's very arcane, but it, it's there. I mean, it, it's it's very deep material, um, and it it can be very controversial. I mean, you have the whole thing with on the Statue of Liberty, that incorporates a lot of Masonic elements, um, the Union College template in Sch Schenectady, New York, um, the Royal Arch uh, in St. Louis, the Gateway Arch is a Royal Arch uh, symbol. Um, the Masonic expansion is expansion westward. Um, and it's the same thing with these movies. Um, it's sort of when I, when, I, when, I, when I do this analyst, and when I analyze this material, when I do this analysis is what I'm trying to say. Um, I do, I do present it. I, I do do a, you know, I guess my training as a lawyer is I ask myself, what could, would I be happy presenting this material to a jury? Exactly. You know, is this evidence that is this evidence that I can, can, can yeah. use to convince a jury? And if the answer is yes, I continue on with it. But then I also run this. I also do a test, and it's it's really, you know. You know, I only analyze these movies and present this material that I, I am absolutely 100% convinced myself that it's going on in. Um, I live by the maxim of when in doubt, throw it out. Um, and if, 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 I can't, if I'm not happy with it and, I, I, you know, and it's looking like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'm stretching or this isn't there, um, you know, I don't do it. I don't, when, I, when I did the movie book, I only analyzed movies that I was 100% convinced of that this material was turning up in, and I was—I I would have no problem presenting this to a jury in a courtroom. We're running rapidly out of time here, Robert. This is this was such a great opportunity to just lightly, and believe me, given the depth of your material, it is lightly um, go into the inquiry in some of this. It's refreshing to talk with someone who's an original thinker in the in the areas like this because they're important subject right now um let people know where they can find you the books the website and all the other things that uh, you want to be heard saying going out yeah well, well for starters thank you randy for having me on off planet radio it was uh, tremendous pleasure. to be here tonight i thought it was a great show um to find me go to www.robertwsullivanivy.com my name is robert w sullivan the fourth um for more on me www.robertwsullivanivy.com there's my bio, there's links to Twitter, Facebook, uh, Facebook fan pages, um, events and appearances. I constantly keep that updated. Um, links to buy the books, of course. You go to my YouTube channel, watch videos I produce, listen to other podcasts and radio shows I've done. Um, it, it's really easy to navigate. Um, just go to and my website. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. So my website is robertwsullivaniv.com, all lowercase, all connected. Links to buy the book. Everything you want is right there. And again, on the screen as you're watching the video. Can't make it easier than that. Robert Sullivan, thanks for coming on tonight and sharing with us. We'll get you back again. This was fun. Um, we'll be back again, I think, next week. We're going to do a live show. I'm not sure yet. Um, best way to catch up with me is Facebook. You can just type in my name, Randy Moggins. You can type in Off Planet Radio, which has a site there. I do post my schedule out usually within a couple days of the show. And don't forget the websites, offplanetradio.com is where you can find the archives and Off Planet Radio, I'm sorry, offplanetmedia.net is the media website. We'll be back again next week with another show. Until then, the truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it.
Namaste.